All right. Good morning. Welcome back. How's everyone doing? Okay. So, uh, any questions before we start? Questions about the second programming assignment or uh, anything else? Okay. So today we are going to continue our discussion on linear regression and linear regression by itself is a fairly simple concept to understand but through that I want to sort of introduce several notions that would help you in other uh, other machine learning algorithms as well all right so the first thing we want to just to recap linear regression is a learning task right so there's classification there is regression I'm sorry not linear regression but regression is a learning task just like classification. The difference between classification and regression is over here, right? So in classification, we are looking at some inputs and we are trying to classify that input into two or more categories. Whereas in linear regression, we are trying to predict a value for a given input, right? That's the only difference. In real life, it's very useful, of course. Uh, so let's say, for example, you want to, you want to find out what, you want to predict what will be the, uh, the in the, you know the any stock index for tomorrow uh, by looking at some certain observations today right so prices of different uh, stocks for today you want to predict what will happen tomorrow something that you can pose as a regression task same thing say you want to predict how how much a student will earn in 10 years looking at that student's um, grades in different courses today or GPA in different areas today right so those are the things that you can do with this, uh, with regression, right? Uh, of course, regression, on at the face of it, it seems like it's making things more complicated than uh, classification because in classification, your y or your output could take values, but now it can take infinite values, right? So, of course, just like any machine learning algorithm, when we deal with this task, the first thing we do is we apply certain, uh, we apply uh, an inductive bias, right? We say, let's try to make our solution space, the space in which our hypothesis is uh, smaller so that we search in it, smaller or structured, right? So the one thing, uh, the one popular way to do regression is what we call linear regression in which we assume that the way y is connected to x is through a linear function which is nothing but a weight vector w and you take your x and you do an inner product or a dot product with w and you get y, right? But so, so the prediction part is easy. Once you have W, you can just do W transpose X, you get your answer. However, the interesting part is how do you learn the parameter? So in this case, the parameter is W, that weight vector. And then last time we looked at two different interpretations of linear regression. One that comes from probability, where we assume that your Y, the thing that you observe, or the target, is a random variable. And we model it as a, uh, as a Gaussian random variable with mean which is centered at W transpose X and some uh, variance, right? So our task is that given some training data, can we estimate or learn W and sigma square? And the same thing we did, uh, we looked at another interpretation from ge geometry where you can think of linear regression as a line fitting exercise. You have points in certain dimensional space and then you want to fit a plane that goes through that those points. Right. So, uh, but the form is still the same because if you remember our discussion in perceptrons, uh, the equation of a line can be written as W transpose X. So it is essentially defining a line that you want to uh, draw or a plane, of course. Right. Then we also saw the notion of adding a bias so that it, it does not necessarily go through the origin and we saw why that is and how to do that. Right? So now we are going to see how to estimate the parameters. All right? And there are many ways to do that. And the reason I'm going to sort of introduce all these ways is that in future you will find that certain other machine learning algorithms might be using one way or another. So it's nice to sort of with this basic easy setting sort of get introduced to all of those. Right? So let's get started with that. So the first thing we want to do is what is our training data? And this is where, again, notation is always important, or the consistency of notation is important. So what we are going to assume is that we are given some training data, which is essentially a bunch of points, x's for those points, and their corresponding values, right? 
So there are two ways to denote that. One is that we are going to assume that all of our training data is in this matrix called a big bold X. So this is a matrix, all right? And all of our labels, corresponding labels are in this vector, which is a bold lowercase y, right? So for example, so the dimensions of this matrix will be n cross uh, d plus 1 because d is the number of attributes you have and 1 is the intercept term that we have added, that constant 1, right? And then y, of course, is just a vector. So it's just n cross 1. So you have n training data points. And what we want to estimate is or learn. In statistics, we call it estimate, but you know, it's a machine learning class. So learn W. And if you are using a probabilistic interpretation, then we also need to learn sigma square from X and Y, right? Uh, another way to look at this training data is that you can also think of each row as your training example. So you can also think of it this as this. So it has x1, y1, x2, y2, x3, y3, and so on. So it's the same thing. So this, if I put all of them into a matrix, then this will become x, right? And each one of these is a number which goes in this big y. So the both, both are equivalent. Uh, 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 representations of our training data. All right. So now what we want to do is we want to estimate or learn our W and we can do it in multiple ways. So let's look at the first way which is the MLE approach. Of course this is tied to the uh, it is likelihood. So this is tied to the probabilistic interpretation. Probabilistic uh, interpretation where we assume that y is a Gaussian random variable, right? So the idea is very simple. If we assume that y is a Gaussian random variable, we can compute the likelihood of the training data. Now, remember that uh, I made that point last time as well, is that in linear regression or in the probabilistic interpretation of linear regression, we only assume that y's, each y inside is a random variable, not x. x is not a random variable, right? So we can compute the likelihood of your training data, which will be a function of W and sigma square, and then we can maximize that likelihood and get W and sigma square. That's easy, right? So the likelihood, of course, will be given by the product over all data points, one through N, and what is the PDF of each YI given your, uh, this, these two parameters. Right, so this is easy. Now there is one point that I might not have mentioned earlier is that uh, this we have done even when we were doing uh, our uh, Bernoulli, I mean our parameter estimation when we said, okay, we have a coin, we are trying to estimate what is theta for that coin, right? So every time what I would do is that I'm given some training data and I would express its likelihood as a product of the probability or PDF or PMF, whatever it is, of observation and multiplying it together, right? One question to ask there is why am I doing that, right? So the likelihood of a data set is just the joint probability of all your data points inside that data set, right? And we simply say that it is a product of the individual probability. The reason we do that is because we make a very key assumption that each data point in this data set is independent of each other, right? Because if you remember, the notion of independence, right? So if I have two events, A and B, if A and B are independent, then I can write it as PA times PB, given A is independent of B, right? That is the only time that we can write it as this, right? So in all of our estimation, we always write it like this, which means that we are always making this implicit assumption that all of our observations are independent of each other. This is not just uh, specific to linear regression in anything, right? In anything in the past, whenever we have computed the log likelihood or likelihood, we have always converted it into product of individual probabilities because we always operate under this assumption of independence. So in machine learning and statistics, you will see that we always say under IID assumption, okay? So what IID means this I is for independent, and this I is for uh, identical. 
I don't know what this D is for. Maybe the D after identical. So, but basically what you're assuming is that all of your data is independent of each other and they're all coming from the same distribution. So, whenever you see this expression, you should, it should immediately click in your mind that, yeah, they're making an IID assumption, right? And in many cases it is true, but in many cases it might not be true and then you cannot write it like this, right? Those are things that we will not discuss in this class, but, uh, but you should be aware of that, all right? So this, this was just a detour. So let's come back to this. So L is written as this, right? Now, uh, now because of the form of probabilistic linear regression, yi is a normal random variable at w transpose xi comma sigma square, right? Which means, implies that I can write my likelihood as the product, right? Uh, is 1 over 2 pi. Uh, sigma right exp minus uh, the observe uh, the value that you observe yi minus w transpose xi because the mean is w transpose xi now right square over 2 sigma square right i think i wrote it last time as well uh, i will take log to compute the log likelihood because i don't want to operate with this product so that will become a log and then this could just become a summation 1 through n log of this whole thing sigma exp minus yi minus my square uh, and this will be and then I'll break this log up so it will be log minus log under root 2 pi minus log sigma right minus log of exp is just identity yi minus w transpose xi whole square over 2 sigma square and then the summation goes inside so the uh, okay let's just keep the summation outside so this is summation of this whole thing right and summation has a beautiful property that it can go inside so it will become now this does not depend on i at all right so this will just be minus n log under 2 pi minus n log sigma minus summation i equal to 1 through n y i minus w transpose x i square over 2 sigma square and I can actually take this 2 sigma square outside because it doesn't depend on i all right sigma i equal to 1 through n y i minus w transpose x i right so this is the log likelihood and now we can we will try to maximize it with respect to sigma and w to get the mle estimates for sigma and w so how do we do that right so the first thing is let's say you want to estimate uh, find w so we are going to assume that sigma is constant and we are going to uh, find w so, and we have done that before we can compute the partial derivative of this log likelihood with respect to w right and then we will set it to zero and we'll find the w that makes that happen and that will be the uh, estimate right so let's compute the log likelihood of oh, sorry the partial derivative with respect to w so when we compute the partial derivative with respect to w this term does not depend on w so that will go away this will go away as well and the, this will stay 1 over 2 sigma square and a beautiful and d by dw of this whole thing all right now you can do this in many ways you can compute this partial derivative in many ways you can actually go inside this summation but i'm going to do it in slightly different way because uh, that is more useful uh, later on all right so the one thing one side discussion i want to have here is that what is this term okay why square right so let me just write it out and then i'll uh, uh, come back to that so what you will see is that this can actually be written as y remember that y was that vector here this vector that contains all of these yi's minus x times w transpose y minus x w okay so this can be written as this Right, 
All right. How do we get to that? Uh, so, I mean, it's just sort of manipulation of all of these quantities, right? So think about this quantity, right? So what is happening here is, uh, <clears throat> so I'm going to sort of try to prove it, but not very formally. But the sketch of the proof is this. So, so basically, this what we are doing in this summation is that we are taking each yi and we are subtracting it with w transpose xi, right? Then we are making a square of that and then adding all of those values up. So think of this as just y1 minus w transpose x1, y2 minus w transpose x2, so on. So think of this column vector, right? So let's call this column vector something. Let's call it delta, all right? Delta is the n cross one column vector, right? So to get this summation of the squares, this can also be written as, so the summation can actually be written as delta transpose delta. Right? Because what does delta transpose delta do? That's an inner product. So basically you're multiplying each value by itself and then adding it all up, right? Which is essentially what you want here, right? So this can be written as delta transpose delta. Now what is delta? So delta, essentially what I'm saying is delta can be written as, uh, so think of it this way, right? So basically you're, these are two different vectors and you're taking a, a, prod, uh, a difference of that. So this can be written as y minus this other quantity. Let's call it uh, eta. So y is your vector, which is all of this. And eta is a vector that is all of this, right? Where eta is just w transpose x1, transpose x2, so on, all the way to w transpose xn. So this is the vector that you have, right? Now what you can see is that, so what is happening here? W is a vector, each xi is also a vector. So you're multiplying each vector with a vector, you're getting a number, right? So you can actually write eta, and this is where I'll stop, is that eta can be written as xw, where in each row of x is x1, x2, and so on, right? So each row contains x, so when you multiply, when you do the matrix multiplication, because this is a n cross d and d cross 1. Let's ignore the intercept part. Let's say it's already there, right? So n cross d, d cross 1. So think of this matrix multiplication. So what happens in the matrix multiplication is that you're taking each row of this matrix, which is actually one of your x's, and you're taking an inner product with your w, right, which is a column vector. So that's exactly what happens here. So that's it, right? So you can write it like this. So if you go back, you can say that this, this whole summation is actually this, right? So in fact, if you remember when you did your uh, programming assignment one, and a lot of you actually turned, uh, were able to remove, when you were computing the, the loss of your data set, a lot of you were able to remove the need for a for loop by just doing matrix multiplication. So you were all, if you go back to your code, essentially you computed something like this. Of course, the loss function was slightly different. So it wasn't exactly this, but you all did this X times W. So that has the same effect, all right? So what I'm gonna, I'm gonna use this result over here. Actually, I'm gonna use this result to rewrite this. So this will be minus one over two sigma square D by DW of y minus bold y x w transpose y minus x w all right now how do we compute this partial derivative is is sort of straightforward all you do is you just open this up right so transpose can go inside the bracket so that is good y transpose minus x w transpose times y minus xw and I'm just going to go through each step I, later on I won't do the same thing for other places but this is one place that I'll sort of go through it so that you you are familiar with how how we do all of this but this is just sort of basic linear algebra 
or matrix algebra, right? Uh, now remember that this can be written as W transpose X transpose, right? And then this is the same. And then I just multiply this. So it will be Y transpose Y minus Y transpose X W minus W transpose X transpose Y uh, plus W transpose X transpose X W. Right. Okay, so that is what uh, we get from this one. Make sure that I'm using the right notation. Any questions so far? All right. Okay. So one thing you will notice is another sidebar discussion here is that these two quantities are actually the same. So Y transpose XW is actually equal to W transpose X transpose Y because uh, right because you can you can think of this quantity this is W so W transpose X transpose is nothing but X W transpose so that means that W transpose X I can't even see that is X W transpose Y right so this term and this term are actually the same because this quantity, this is going to be a column vector, right? Because it is n cross d times d cross 1. So it's an n cross 1 vector. So we are multiplying one n cross 1 vector with another one, just a dot product. So which is same as multiplying this with this. So the dot product is uh, actually the, uh, you know, symmetric. So, so you can just, right, so y transpose x w is same as x w transpose y because dot products are just symmetric. So I'm going to just re rewrite this and say that this is 1 minus d by d w, this I don't care about, minus, I'm just going to say this is one of them. I just treat for 2 y transpose x w because these both are same plus W transpose X transpose X W. Okay? No question so far, right? Now I'm going to start doing the derivative. So, of course, this does not depend on W. So, this is going to go away. So, it will be minus 2 sigma square, right? So, this is not there. Then minus 2 Y transpose X partial derivative. So, think of this as just uh, a scalar multiplied with w, right, or a constant term multiplied with w. So that will just be this, right, because d by dw of w is 1. Plus, now comes this interesting part. This is d by dw of w transpose x transpose xw. All right. Now, this one, of course, is fairly easy to do. So this is what we are trying to do. Yeah, w is actually a vector. So now you are actually taking a derivative of something with respect to a vector. So this is where we, we leverage our vector calculus magic. And uh, that is something that you can actually get from the matrix cookbook. So I'm just going to use a standard result, all right? So this is a n cross d. So this is constant with respect to w, right? So all you're trying to do is actually you're trying to compute d by dw of some vector times some constant matrix time w, right? And this is a known result and you can actually work it out later. So if you if you're interested in this, you can come to me, but I'm just going to write the final result, which is two times a w. Right? And you can think of this uh, analogous to how you do uh, in a when you had a single value, right? So d by d x of some a x square, right? This is 2 x, 2 a x. Right? So this is also like a square uh, square term in w. So you're multiplying w with itself and a constant value. So that's why they are fairly analogous to each other. But refer to the matrix cookbook if you want to look at the derivation, right? 
So, so I'm going to use that uh, result here. Ooh, where are my results? So the partial derivative is going to become minus 2 sigma square minus 2 y transpose x plus 2 uh, x transpose x double. All right. Now we'll set this to 0. Set d by dw of log of l to 0. So it implies that minus 2 sigma square minus 2 y transpose x plus 2 x transpose x w is equal to 0. Did I mess up somewhere? Uh, this is fine. Right. Now this term goes away. We are assuming this is not 0. So then we'll say that, and the 2 goes away. So x transpose x w is equal to y transpose x. Okay. Aha. This is where my got confused a little bit. I'm sorry. I should have so I mean it doesn't change anything, but remember these two quantities were the same, right? So I would use this part. So I'll say uh, two times W transpose X. So you see the, the problem I'm having is that this quantity is, uh, so this is going to be one cross N times N cross D. So this will be one cross D, right? And this is going to be D cross D times d cross 1. So this is going to be d cross 1. So actually what we can do is we can express this quantity in two ways. You can also say this is equal to 2 w transpose a transpose. All right. So this is the same thing. So that's what I'm going to use here. So it's going to be 2 w transpose transpose of this. So this we set to 0. So it will be minus 2 sigma square equal to 0. All right, this works. Uh, so so I, I ignore this, I move things around and then it becomes W transpose X transpose X transpose is equal to Y transpose X. So now let me see if all the things are, so this is 1 cross D vector, it's going to be d cross d, so 1 cross d, 1 cross n, n cross d, yeah, perfect. So this is this, right? And now I want to find the w, so I want to move things over here. So first thing I'll do is I'll take a, 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 a transpose on both sides. So take transpose on both sides. And then transpose basically goes inside and flips things around. So it will be x transpose x times w is equal to x transpose y all right and then we just move this here so w will be equal to so when this moves here it becomes an inverse so this is the derivation for the mle for w all right just by maximizing our uh, the whole likelihood you could have arrived at the same solution by simply computing uh, the derivative of each one of this component inside the summation and then adding it up it will give you the same answer but i went this way just so that we can stick to the matrix uh, representation all right so this is the mle for w and any questions so far yes aha very good question so one thing that we have done here is that we have said that so let's take a look at this. W is X transpose X. So X was your N cross D matrix, right? So X transpose X will actually be a D cross D matrix, right? Now we take an inverse of that. So anybody who has done, all of you have, uh, matrix uh, or linear algebra knows that you cannot simply compute the inverse of any square matrix, 
right? If there is any singularity in your matrix, then your inverse will, you cannot compute, right? Because, so what does singularity mean? It means that if you have D columns in your matrix, but some are linearly, a linear combination of some other columns, which means that the rank of this matrix is not D, it's less than D, then you cannot compute the inverse of that. It's like saying, can I compute the 1 by 0? It's like division by 0, the same thing you cannot compute an inverse of uh, any matrix, right? Which means that if there is singularity, then you won't be able to do this, right? So that is a question, that is, so there is no answer to that. So if your data has this property, then you won't be able to learn the W. So, but the question to ask is that what induces that singularity, right? And the singularity will come, so think of this, right? So this is actually nothing but, uh, it's kind of like covariance matrix, right? That's how you compute the covariance. Of course, you also put the, put the um, you also subtract by the mean, right? But basically this singularity comes if your attributes in your X are dependent on each other. Right? Which means that before doing linear regression, you want to remove any dependence like that. Right? So you start with this assumption that all of your attributes are independent of each other, which will ensure that this will never be singular. But if you don't ensure that, which could happen in real life, right? In real life, I will get a data set which has 20 attributes. I have no clue if something is dependent on each other or not. So if I directly apply this formulation, you might not get an, an answer. So that is, uh, uh, that is a possibility, that this might fail if there is singularity in this matrix, all right? And then there are ways to address that, and we'll, we'll look at that later on, right? So later on, we'll see other ways to handle this issue. But this direct computation does suffer from that issue, all right? Any other questions? Yes. So, so the, the question is that there are other ways to compute inverse as well, right? So there's notion of pseudo inverse. There's a, you can also express this in a different form, which is called more Penrose sort of formulation, right? So you can change this. So if you feel that, hey, I'm not able to compute this, you can change it. So yeah, people do that as well. I'll come to that later on. So the, uh, I don't want to confuse uh, others, but yes, the answer is that you could apply some other ways of robustly computing this inverse. Another thing that we do in linear regression is that we actually never compute the inverse, okay? So if you have, uh, so in linear algebra, I don't know if that's how it's taught to you, but computing inverse is never a good idea because it's, it's not very stable to compute the inverse. So what people usually do is, you can think of this whole equation, right? So this is a, so X cross, uh, is a D cross D matrix, right? And this is X transpose Y is actually a, a D cross one vector, right? So what you want to compute here is something like Y is equal to A inverse Z, right? Where A is X transpose X. And so in linear algebra, we call this as a system of equations, right? So this is like solving a system of equation. I give you D equations, linear equations, and I, and you want to find the solution. So if I, if the system of equation is Z equal to AW, and you want to find the W that solves this, right? So we actually, if you look at any linear regression code, Inside, they don't really compute the inverse. They actually try to solve this system of equation. And there are many ways to solve this. It's, there's a college scheme method. There is, a, you know, other Newton's, uh, uh, there's a Gauss Newton method as well. So there are many ways to compute this uh, answer without directly computing the inverse. So this is more, this issue comes when we are really dealing with real data sets where you have no guarantee if this is sing, uh, if, if the solution, if the, uh, sorry, not a solution, but the inverse will be stable or not. And in that case, you could do other things. And one of the things is that you, instead of actually computing the inverse first, you directly solve this system of equation inside. And that's what a lot of the, uh, I mean, most of the linear regression codes that you will see do. They never actually compute the inverse. Okay? Any other questions? All right. So that is good. Another thing that we can do is, and I'll maybe not jump into that, you can also 
learn sigma. Actually, sigma is easier. So you can compute the partial derivative of this whole thing with respect to sigma. The reason I say it is easier is that sigma only comes here and here, right? So this part will go away. So we can we can quickly do that. So the partial derivative of the log of L with respect to sigma will be equal to, so remember, so this part will go away. This will just be minus N over sigma. The derivative of log of sigma is minus N over sigma minus 1 over, now this is 2 will stay here, sigma square will become sigma cube and there will be a 2 up here, right, because it's sigma raised to minus 2 and this minus will become plus times this whole thing, this will stay. So I'm, I'm not going to write it here, or oh, in fact we can write it in the other notation, y minus x w transpose y, right. Now this 2 will cancel this 2 out, then we set this to 0, so d log L over d sigma equal to 0, right, so when we set this equation to 0, this will give us sigma equal to, or sigma square equal to 1 over n, so you can, you can fill in the intermediate steps, but this is fairly easy to do. So this is the MLE estimate for sigma, alright, any questions on that? All right, so now you know how to train your uh, linear regression method, right? And all the steps are there in the handouts too. <clears throat> but these are the expressions that you get at the end. Whew. All right, now another way to do the thing uh, is to go via the, the, the geometric interpretation, right? So we want to remember in geometric interpretation, we are not assuming that y is a random variable. We are assuming y is a value then we are trying to fit a line. So the way to do that is very similar. So geometric interpretation, all you're trying to do is that, let's say your data is like this. So this is your x's, this is your x1, and this is your y. Let's say there's, your d is just one, right? Now what you try to do is you try to fit a line, okay? So you can fit any line. Let's say, let's say this is a line I fit, which is parameterized by W, of course, right? Now what you do is you try to see, okay, how much error will this line incur, right? So, th so the error would be that since this is the line, right, which means that for this value of X, the prediction will be here. So this is the error because of this line. This will be the error for this point. This will be the error for this point, error for this point. Let's say there's a point here as well error for this point, and so on, right? So what you want to do now is try to find a W which will minimize the total error, all right? So what is this error? Let's say this is X, the first point. So the error for this will be Y, Y1, which is the value for the first point, minus, so Y1 is actually this, right? This is Y1, and this is the corresponding thing on the line, which will just be W transpose X1. Right, so this is the error between what you predict and what the actual value is. And of course, we want to only work with absolute, so I'll take a summation, and oh, sorry, a, a square, plus Y2 minus W transpose X2 square, which is this value, plus so on, and until Yn Square, which is exactly what we did even in uh, MLE, which is just a summation, i equal to 1 through n, y, uh, y1 minus, yi minus w transpose xi square. That's it, right? So it's the same, almost the same expression, right? Now we want to find w that minimizes this loss. So remember, in the, in the case of MLE, we were dealing with we were dealing with a log likelihood and we were trying to max find w that maximizes this value right and here we try to find w that minimizes this value and that is fine because we have uh, this is not there's no negative sign here so there's negative sign so it's the same thing right 
So the answer turns out to be the same, right? Because if you try to maximize, minimize uh, this, find W that minimizes this, you will follow the same philosophy, right? The first thing you will say is I'm going to write it as Y minus X W transpose Y minus X W. And then you will compute the partial derivative, set it to zero. So your W will again come to the same value. It's X transpose X inverse X transpose Y. So there are two different interpretations, but the but the derivation is the same. You get the same W. Of course, in this, you do not have a sigma. You just have a W. But the, this is what we call the least squares estimate. Because here we are trying to minimize the squared loss, right? So this is kind of like what we did in uh, uh, Perceptron as well. Similar, similar loss function. So the loss function is this. And we are trying to figure out what is the least value. But the answer is the same. Okay. Any questions so far? All right. Fantastic. So next thing I want to do is just talk about one more thing, which is that what this gives you, right? This and what we did in MLE, they give you what we call one shot answer. You have X and Y to compute Y, uh, to compute your W, which is a parameter, you just apply this equation. Right? You just compute it. Very easy. However, you can also do this in a slightly different way. Remember, you have a loss function. right? Now, this loss function, if you want to minimize this, minimize this, we can also apply gradient descent to this. Right? Remember, uh, we did similar thing for neural network is that here is my loss function, jw, which is a function of w, and I want to find w that minimizes it. So instead of directly computing this by you know setting it to zero i can actually just compute the gradient of this loss function with respect to w and then feed it to our psi pi dot optimize dot minimize and it can give you a w as well right so that is so there is another way to do it which is minimize the squared loss using gradient descent now since we have done this so so many times i'm not going to tell you how to do that right so all you need to do is you need to compute the partial derivative of this loss function with respect to W, which is exactly what we did in perceptrons as well. And then we, we basically update our W. So we start with some initial value of W, and then we keep updating W uh, along the direction of the gradient, well, against the direction of the gradient, until we converge, all right? And that will also give you some answer, all right? And the question that you should ask is that, why would I do that? Why would I compute this? when I have this direct way of computing the right answer, right? And that is where I go back to your question. So remember here, you want to compute this, right? But we have no guarantee that this inverse or even the system of equations is computable because for that to happen, this needs to be a uh, non-singular matrix, right? It's, its rank should be D, it cannot be less than D. In real application, sometimes it's not easy to guarantee that. So let's say you have a data set in which you have million uh, attributes, which happens a lot in bioinformatics and so on, right? So you have million attributes, and so your X, your D is actually million. So you're trying to compute the, you find linear regression model, fit the linear regression model. So the first thing you'll have to do is, you'll have to solve this system of equation in which the matrix is million by million. And a lot of times, doing that is hard, right? Because now you start running into singularity issues, computational issues, and so on. When your D is small, let's say you have five features, then you have a five by five matrix, then it's easy. You can even do it by hand. But when you're dealing with million cross million matrices, then you can't do that, right? But in gradient descent, it turns out that you do not have to do any solution. You don't have to solve that system of equations. All you need to do is compute the partial derivative, which will actually be uh, probably in the handouts I have that, right? Here. So the partial derivative is over here, which is just so partial derivative with respect to each of your weight entry is this, right? So if you look here, we are not solving any system of equations here, right? We, this can be done simply by doing matrix multiplication with vectors and so on. So this becomes computationally more feasible 
and it will also guarantee that you will not run into those singularity issues even if your data has singularity so even if your this is not computable you can still do gradient descent and do that all right so when you go back and look at your programming assignment too uh, of course the first problem is about qda and lda so we have done that before the second one the second problem is that you want to do linear regression directly like this okay and the third one actually is where I ask you to do gradient descent to do the same thing. And what you will see is that in both settings, you will reach the arrive at the same answer because this is a fairly easy uh, objective function. It's fairly convex. So there is a solution and it will reach there. So, but there are two different ways of doing that. Another interesting property here is that you can now also uh, use stochastic gradient descent to get the answer. Remember stochastic gradient descent, we compute the objective fun function with respect to one variable, one training example, do the whole thing, then take the next training example and do the whole thing. So stochastic gradient descent can also be used here. All right. So now just to recap, what we have done is we've looked at linear regression, we have looked at two different interpretations of linear regression, and we have seen many ways of finding the weight vector, right? One is least squares, one is doing gradient descent, one is doing the MLE. And least squares and MLE actually give you the same expression. There's no difference. Uh, gradient descent, there is no expression. You actually just feed it to a minimizer. But what you will see is that you'll always arrive at the same answer. There's no different answer, right? Any questions so far? Okay, so the next thing I want to introduce before we leave is what are the issues? So this is linear regression, plain vanilla linear regression, you can use it and be happy. But it turns out that linear regression by itself is not very powerful. It does not work everywhere. So it has some issues and it also has some limitations. Okay? So the issues are, the first issue is that it is susceptible to outliers. So susceptible to outliers means that if your training data has some outliers, your linear regression becomes very unstable. So then other thing is that since it is making that linearity assumption, sometimes maybe a line might not be a good fit. Sometimes you might not want to fit a, a curve, right? So linear regression doesn't do that directly. Uh, there are other issues like it's unstable when your inputs are correlated, which of course gives issues like what I talked earlier that this will become singular. And then it also gets confused by unnecessary attributes. So these are four different issues and what we will see in the next class are four different ways to handle this. But before you leave, let me just sort of introduce the first issue, which is this notion of uh, susceptibility to outliers. All right, so let's see that. So here I'm using uh, in um, Python, whatever library it is, I think SciPy, there's a library called fit. It, it fits a line, okay? But in your assignment, you do not use this. You have to encode it yourself. But here, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna generate some data. So let's say this is my data. This is my X and this is my Y. And I want to fit a line, right? So I can use linear regression. Actually, I'm using uh, um, SK learned linear regression. When I fit it, this is the weight vector that I get. This is my W0. This corresponds to my intercept term. And this is the w1 right so this is my w together now and if i draw it it looks like this right so this is the line that was fit pretty good right it's tried to minimize the least square error, uh, the squared error now let's see what happens if i introduce an outlier in my training data so here what i did was i artificially changed one of these values and made it large so this is what it looks like now right so the rest of the data is the same but I introduce this one more value here, just to confuse my linear regression. Now, when I fit my linear regression to this new data, what you will see is that the, the parameters have changed, right? So earlier they were uh, minus 3.643 and 0.1, and suddenly they have significantly changed. And this is just by introduction of one outlier which is not good, right? We do not want our linear regression model to change so much just because of one bad point, right? And that is an issue with linear regression is that it's actually 
messes up a lot. So this is what it did, right? So when I fit a line now, what you will see is that it got biased by this outlier. It tried to move the line so that it accepts this outlier. And the reason that happens is because if it had not moved here, the penalty that it would have paid in your loss function would have been huge, right? So if it had stayed here, then the penalty from here to here would have been whatever this value and square of that because there's a square there when you compute the loss, right? So that is why linear regression is so susceptible to outlier because if there is any one outlier, then if it does not respond to that outlier, if it doesn't, if it does not move towards the outlier, the penalty will be huge, right? And that is where there are other models and that is what we will discuss. One of the things that we'll discuss on Monday is how do we learn in the presence of outliers? And that is what we call robust regression. So in fact, so let me just show that model to you. So there is a stats model package in Python which has robust regression. What that does is that it learns, but it does not get affected by the outliers that much. So remember, so it is very similar to this value, not too much. And if you fit the line, you will see that this is what happened. So it pretty much ignored this outlier. So in next class, we will see what happens inside this robust regression. What does it do so that it is not impacted by this outlier that much? And I'll give you a clue. The clue lies in the fact that linear regression, when it computes its loss function, right? It does this square here. So loss for every data point is basically the square of the difference. And that is why it gets so impacted by the outliers because if it does not respond to the outlier, the penalty it pays the square of that. What robust regression does is that it does not put square there. Instead of square, it makes it just the absolute value so that you do not really pay that much penalty. So it can, it is okay to ignore those points. So that is what will happen. So we'll look at that in next class. Any questions so far? All right, very nice. So we'll stop here. So have a good weekend and I'll see you on Monday. Thank you very much.